You are about to enter the world of urban legends, where fact is often stranger than fiction. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between truth and urban legend. On Urban Legends, we bring you three remarkable tales. Two are just urban myths, but one story actually happened. Can you guess which one is true? Is it the crack addict who took a bullet in the chest and miraculously coughed up the slug? The businessman who wakes up from a one-night stand in Rio, robbed of a kidney? Or is it the one about the driver who's gunned down by a gang for flashing his headlights at their car? Can you separate truth from fiction? All will be revealed at the end of the show. First up, coughing up bullets. In 1994, East Chicago resident Kim Ivory was firmly on the wrong side of the tracks. I was drug addicted, and I have been for years. Kim was smoking $300 of crack a day and was seriously hooked. That craving came, that possession rose up in me, and I decided that I was going to uh, over to Haven, Indiana and get some drugs. Saturday, 19th of February, 9.15, Kim went to get his next hit of crack. Yeah, my shit, man. You stole me 500 bucks from last time. You know I'll pay you, man. This time, a dispute came up about the money. You owe me over $500. Well, I'm good for you, man. You know I'll pay you for it. Give my f***ing money. F*** you, man. Screw you. I stuck my hand inside of my coat to see you know, what it was, and I pulled my hand back out, and it was full of blood. He managed to drive a short distance from the scene before passing out. Kim woke up in the hospital. He'd been shot at close range in the chest with a 38. He was lucky to be alive. The slug had passed through his thorax, hitting both his lungs. Not only that, but it had stopped short of his spine by less than an inch. His doctors had refused to remove it for fear of crippling him. Kim Ivory resigned himself to having a 38 caliber slug in his chest for the rest of his life, even if it meant setting off airport metal detectors whenever he traveled. But this was just the start of Kim's strange story. Kim was from a good family. While he worshiped crack, his big sister Cynthia was worshiping Jesus. Just call on Jesus. Call on Jesus. I say, and he'll help you. Cynthia decided it was time that Kim saw the light. And with a 38 slug in his chest, who was he to argue with his big sister? So just 15 days after the shooting, Kim walked arm in arm with Cynthia into the Faith Temple Church of God in Christ in Chicago. And my sister said, you're gonna let the evangelist pray for you. And I said, sure. And he pointed his finger at me. Now I had told this man nothing about my brother, not a word. He said, you know why that happened to you? He said, God is trying to get your attention. And he began to pray. He said, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I command you to loose this man and set him free. And he said, I changed this water from natural to spiritual. And he handed me the water and told me to drink it. And I began to drink the water. The holy water turned out to be refreshment for the soul. And Kim swapped crack for Christ in an instant. Do you fear the healing power within you? Praise the Lord. And he said, go on home. And as I began to walk away, he said, but come back tonight. I'm going to allow you to hear your testimony. How Jesus saved your life. We went back home, and I asked him, I said, you want to go to church tonight? And he was like, yeah. He said, if that devil didn't kill me then, he ain't going to get me now. But before Kim could go back to church, a miracle came to him in the bathroom of his sister's house. <laughs> as I was in the bathroom preparing, to go back for the night service. And I just felt a little tickle in my throat and I just wanted to clear my throat a little. I bent over and I coughed again, but this time I felt something hit me in the front of my mouth. And I didn't know what it was. I began to ease my hand open. I saw that bullet looking at me. Jesus had performed a miracle. 
And that was the beginning of a new life. Kim Ivory claims the bullet, which was meant to kill him, lodged itself harmlessly in his chest. And he, with a gulp of holy water, divine intervention, and a whole lot of faith, was able to cough it out. Can a man really cough up a bullet after being shot in the chest? We put that question to Dr. Brian Goldman. My take on this is that it's, an almo it's almost a physical impossibility. If this guy coughed up a bullet fragment, it means that the bullet was somehow in his air passages, his bronchioles. That means that the bullet, which was in his spine, well behind the lungs, well behind the bronchi, would have to make a hell of a trip. The idea that a bullet fragment could traverse this particular route would be next to impossible. Urban legend or truth? Can a man really take a bullet in the chest at close range and survive, and then cough up the bullet? What do you think? The answer's coming at the end of the show. The Lord has worked a miracle here today. Praise the Lord. We've got two more stories to come, but before that, sink your teeth into this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 202, the choking Doberman. Quebec, 1978, a family returned home from a day out and released their pet Doberman from the basement. The dog was coughing and hacking, clearly in pain. They rushed him to the vet, who took an x-ray, then returned with the verdict. There, clearly lodged in the dog's esophagus, were two human fingers. When the horrified family returned home that night, they checked the basement to find a burglar dead in the corner from shock and massive bleeding, missing two fingers. Is that true? It's false. This urban legend first surfaced in 1981 and has been doing the rounds ever since. We've got three stories on urban legends. Only one is true. Is it the man who coughed up a bullet after being shot in a drug deal? Or is it the tale of a German businessman who was a victim of kidney napping? We'll let you know at the end of the show. Meet Klaus Tauber, a traveling salesman from Munich, Germany, who in May 1997 had a business trip to Rio he'd never forget. Somebody stole my kidney. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Over four million tourists flock to the South American hotspot every year to soak up the culture. Visitors seldom stray far from the beaches because Rio is home to some of the world's most vicious gangs, responsible for over 4,000 murders a year and thousands of kidnapping, robbery, and extortion cases. And there's a new area of criminal enterprise that's caught one of Rio's hardened cops by surprise. Meet Detective Jose Conde of Rio's 12th Precinct. Now they have a, another issue, trafficking uh, human organs, human organs. In Brazil, there's a black market for everything, including human body organs. Last year, over 400 kidneys were bought and sold on the black market. Most were taken unwillingly from poor slum dwellers. Kidney thefts were largely unreported outside of Brazil. But then in May 1997, Klaus Tauber visited Rio. I've been sent to South America, to Brazil. I work for uh, electronic parts uh, company and sell electronic parts. Now I stay in Rio in a really pretty place, Gabea. But uh, this night I feel a little bored. Rio's exotic nightlife would lead him right into the lair of the kidney thief. The problem is that here in Gavia, that's just a half mile up to here into Rocinha. Rocinha is a bad place to be after dark. Even worse for a policeman to be after dark. I leave my hotel and go up the hill. I see or hear loud music, so I decide, oh, there's a discotheque. So I decide I go in. Klaus's search for a good time led him here. 
Straight away, I go to the bar, looked around. Funky place, beautiful girls, you know, Brazilians. And then uh, one woman come to me, very pretty. <laughs> You know, and I'm a, a married man, but we talk, only talk. Then I drank a couple more. And then she decides, okay, I take it from the bar and bring it to me. Klaus had fallen into an elaborate entrapment scam. He didn't know that his last drink was a concoction that delivered a knockout punch. Drugged and deluded. Klaus was about to become the first foreign victim of Rio's kidney trade. Meet British doctor and kidney expert Matthew Hollins of the All Souls Hospital, Liverpool. You'd be surprised how easy it might be to take a man's kidney. The conventional operation involves cutting the skin from the back here, around just under the 12th rib, quite a large incision coming round to the front, and then that enables you to get access to the back of the patient and remove the kidney. Provided you have an operating theatre, an anaesthetist, a skilled nurse, and time, you can remove a kidney safely and efficiently. This is the sort of thing that's done on battlefield operation theatres uh, all the time in uh, difficult situations. The next day, I wake up and I feel a pain. Here on the left side, freezing cold, blood everywhere. He didn't know it yet, but Klaus was missing his left kidney. In one operation, they can make $10,000. $10,000 dollars a lot of money in the city of Rio de Janeiro. The thieves were not, however, entirely without mercy. Klaus had been left in a bath of ice that slowed down his blood loss. They had also left behind a fully charged cell phone and the number for the local Rio emergency services. Although they commit brutal crimes, the thieves prefer to leave their victims alive. In Rio, kidney theft carries a maximum of seven years, whereas murder is punished by death. The gangs think, oh, he has so much, and he doesn't need the both kidneys anyway. We can leave it to him with just one. No problem, let's take it. That's what they think. <clears throat> Klaus then attempted Hello? to use the cell phone to call for emergency medical help. Hello? He passed out, but officials were able to trace the call and help soon arrived. Hello? Hello? Klaus woke up two days later in the hospital. Then comes the doctor to me and say, uh, my left kidney is gone. Somebody stole my kidney. Then it's really a big shock for me. Money, okay, and mobile phones, but not the kidney. Ten years later, Klaus lives on without his left kidney, and to this day, he still doesn't know where it went. He hasn't left Europe since. So is there a thriving trade in body parts in Rio de Janeiro? And was Klaus Tauber really a victim of kidney theft? You'll find out at the end of the show. In the meantime, see if you can guess correctly on this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 67, the digit deception. In March 2005, Anna Ayala of Las Vegas claimed she'd bitten into a disgusting morsel in a bowl of fast food chili a one-inch-long segment of human finger. She tried to sue the company for massive compensation until it was proven that Anna had dropped the finger into the chili herself. The detached digit belonged to her husband's colleague who had sold it to her for $50 after losing it in an accident. But was the digit deception for real? Well, yes, it is. In January 2006, Anna was sentenced to nine years in prison for conspiring to make a false claim and attempted grand theft. We have three stories for you in Urban Legends. We've seen the man who coughed out a bullet, 
and the salesman whose kidney was stolen in South America. But are these stories bona fide or bogus? Don't decide until you've watched our third criminal caper. This is the story of innocent motorists who are gunned down by gangs for flashing their headlights. In June 1998, the Los Angeles Police Department issued the following warning. This is a public service announcement. Drivers are warned to beware of any vehicle driving without their headlights at night. If you see a car with no lights, do not flash them. The occupants are considered armed and extremely dangerous. If you see a car with no lights, call 911 immediately. The notice was posted throughout Los Angeles, but after two months, the shooting stopped just as quickly as they had started. This is the story. Meet Tyrell Simpson, 26 years old, LA gang leader, at least he used to be. Meet Kenyon Hurd. Kenyon idolized Tyrell and was desperate to become a fully fledged member of his gang. I ran with the juniors. We looked up to the bigger guys. You know, we, we were the little guys. You know, Tyrell used to call us his little soldiers. Kenyon knew that in order to move up the ranks from little soldier, there was a price to pay. To become a full member, you had to pass initiation. LAPD officer and gang crime specialist Gaspar Areza trails the mean streets of LA and deals with gangs firsthand. He knows their history. Traditionally, an African-American gang that stemmed from the 40s and 50s. By the 90s, this gang grew into a well-established outfit with its own rules and rites of passage. They perform these initiations into these gangs. A junior member who's not yet full-fledged will chase down any car that has given them a courtesy light to tell them that their headlamps are off and unleash the full magazine into that car. Desperate to be part of their crew, Kenyon would do just about anything to join them. This house going down. You drive the car, the lights on. Now the first person you see flash their lights at you, you know, follow them, all right? Name the game is flash and blast. The people who are, who are shot down in these, in these vehicles are usually anonymous people. They have nothing to do with gangs at all. They're just the first people that happen to give them a courtesy flash. So Kenya knew what he had to do, and he set out that day determined to kill. I knew, I knew I had to do it. You know, everybody knew if you didn't kill to prove your loyalty to Terrell, then he was going to kill you. I remember like it was yesterday. Um, <laughs> I came out fresh. I had everything on brand new. Even my underwear was brand new. So I, I even had a new gun for the day, you know? Came out, met up with my homeboys. You know, we hit the strip, drinking, smoking. 10 p.m. sharp. Wow, when I slap off my, my headlights. Somebody flashed me. I U-turned, wheeled up behind them, and man, the speed I was coming, they knew they was in trouble. All I could see was silhouettes, you know, so I just aimed and squeezed. Bang, 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 click, click, click. I just drove off, man, I was elated. I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know what I mean? Kenyon had made his first kill. He was now a full-fledged gang member. Tyrell would be proud of his little soldier, except Tyrell was dead. Tyrell was the driver who had flashed Kenyon. He was now lying dead in a pool of blood, three bullets in his chest. In a bizarre twist of fate, Tyrell had been out in the hood looking for his new recruit. Everyone knew Tyrell's car, a white Lincoln Continental. But that day, the Lincoln was in the repair shop and Tyrell was in another car. When Tyrell flashed at Kenyon to pull over, Kenyon didn't recognize his boss in such a small car. If I didn't carry out the orders that Tyrell gave me, he would have killed me. That's deep. Only 17 years old, Kenyon had committed the crime as a juvenile, and after serving seven years in Mira Loma Detention Center, he was released on parole in September 2005. But is this story true? 
While you ponder the answer to that question, see if you can sleuth out the answer to this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 112, the murder that never was. In 2003, Ruben Dario Oviero, from Tucumán, Argentina, was arrested for the murder of his brother-in-law, identified as one Pedro Roldan. Oviero maintained his innocence, but was found guilty by a local judge. But soon afterwards, supposed victim Mr. Roldan was spotted alive in Tucumán by Ruben's niece. She thought she'd seen a ghost, but it was her father, Pedro Roldan, alive, walking the streets. So was that story false, or did you resurrect the truth? Did someone really get sent to jail for the murder of a man who was still alive? Yes, he certainly did. And after serving 18 months for a crime he didn't commit, Reuben was freed. We've shown you three tales from the Twilight world where fact meets fiction. Have you been able to tell the difference? To sort out wrong from right? It's time to reveal which of our three stories is true. Is it Klaus Tauber and his missing kidney? Nonsense. Random back alley kidney stealing just won't work. The tissue and blood types of the donor and recipient must be carefully matched. You can't just grab a tourist, steal a kidney and hope to find a buyer. And what about Kenyon and his car flash killing? Sorry, but it's not true. This particular tale has been set in many parts of the world where gangs exist. The US, Canada, and even Europe. The story starts by some form of an announcement, then it spreads like wildfire by word of mouth and email, telling people to beware. However, there's never been a single verified story anywhere of such a gang initiation ritual. So feel free to flash your headlights as a courtesy without dire consequences. So that means that Kim Ivory really did take a bullet in the chest which lodged itself next to his spine. He really did drink holy water and mend his ways. And he really did cough up that 38 slug. Amazing and true. The Lord has worked a miracle here today. And that was the beginning of a new life. That's all for this time on Urban Legends. But remember, when you're taking a walk on the wild side, strange things really do happen. Or do they? <laughs>